Minute in both Mississippi uh, and Louisiana as agronomist uh, at plant material centers. Um, he's he, he served as a coordinator for nonprofit resource conservation development council. Um, and for the last six years, uh, he's been focused on watershed-based uh, special initiatives, um, primarily the Mississippi River Basin Initiative, the National Water Quality Initiative, the Migratory Bird Habitat Initiative, and the Gulf of Mexico Initiative, as well as the Long Lake, um, Long Lake Pond Initiative. Um, he and his family both have a uh, orange orchard, sustainable orange orchard, um, in Vermilion Parish, and uh, Southern Grove Citrus, is that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, Scott's a graduate of Stephen F. Austin University uh, with a Bachelor's of Agronomy, a Bachelor of Science in Agronomy, a minor of Political Science, and master, a Master's of Soil Science. And it was at Stephen F. Austin where he, uh, he learned he didn't like trees. <laughs> <laughs> Went in as a forester and decided he didn't like trees, so perfect for the yeah. prairie community. Yeah, it's an axe of jack. And we're lumberjacks, we cut trees down. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave it to, to Scott. To thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So I've been asked to talk about the Louisiana Native Plant Initiative, the past, the present, and then future uh, opportunities. And so as a part of that bio, I, I am now in administration. I've advanced far enough in my career that I've lost all touch with the reality or the <laughs> in our state office. And so even worse, just recently I've become the assistant for programs. So that's all the financial assistance program. So now I'm an agronomist, soil science, playing a banker on TV. So, um, but I introduced myself as a recovering plant material specialist because that's how I started my career and how I got to Louisiana and then the path that it took us uh, as we went as we went along. How do we advance? Sorry, just I'll put the arrow to the right. So you can there we go. So in the beginning, and so that's the beginning of my time here in Louisiana when um, I got here was the state plant material specialist. So we had such a robust program, we had a coastal specialist that only dealt with all of our coastal restoration projects that we did in Louisiana. So uh, when I got here, we were gonna talk about USDA as a customer of commercially available native plant seeds and what got us going down there. But this is an old slide it was actually back in the beginning, but kind of set the stage. There was this growing interest from both the public and private, so other federal agencies, state agencies, land trusts, plus private landowners that wanted to do more large scale plantings of natives. So beyond prairie, but just any kind of native habitat restoration. But there was a lack of commercial available plant material that was adapted across Louisiana. And so the one thing I want to talk about is, is a lot of this presentation that you'll see, it's, it's trying to get seed availability at scale to go after that 300 acre planting. And so that was the main premise of how our agency and, and where we were going. Um, and then the commercially available sources of locally adapted plant materials, they didn't survive very well in Louisiana. And so even though it was a native switchgrass, it was originally collected and harvested and increased in Kansas. And so coming down to our climate and then rainfall and lack of winter, it just, it didn't persist. So there was a need for us to develop this program, Louisiana Native Plant Initiative, but the way that it came home for our agency and made it very easy to talk to our administration about why we need to go down this path was that in 2002, uh, Alan Dolores Dietz, landowners in Vermilion Parish wanted to enter into our wetland reserve program. And they were prairie enthusiasts. They had a remnant along Highway 14 that was right in front of their property. They had rice land that had been converted, prairie that had been converted back in the 40s. And um, they wanted to put it into a perpetual easement, but they wanted to do it back to prairie. And we had never done that in Louisiana within this easements program. Most of that work, we have 300 plus thousand acres along our Mississippi Delta, it's all bottom line hardwood trees. So it was 
we're going to do this, we're going to make it a special project, you know, how are we going to uh, make that happen? One, and I wish I'd have put the slide, I just saw it across the parking lot, but in the 40s we had aerial photos of South Louisiana and you could see the pimple mounds. <laughs> And at the time, the Soil Conservation Service, a rice farmer, came in and wanted to put that into rice production. And so we, as a federal agency, helped him level the pimple mounds to make rice production. And then we came back in and actually overlaid the current photo of the map over those pimple mounds and tried to recreate them. That's a whole other story. But we were here we were as an agency bearing the cost of putting it so this is the, the prairie, our you know, historic prairie in the tan. You're in Lafayette, Abbeville, and then as you come across Gaydon, that's a little community. It's about two miles uh, east of Gaydon is where this WRP project was. So things that we did, we did restore hydrology. It's a wetland reserve <coughs> program. We had to go back in and try to put it back. Uh, of the 250 acres, there were areas, and I'll show you a map here at the end, but there were, you know, wet, shallow water areas. So we tried to go back in and mimic those. We went back in and put the pimple mounds in. Now I can say this, we put them in the exact location and size. We came nowhere near the soil type consistency, plant community. All we did was we put about 100 jumping off points for every invasive species in the plant. Oh. <laughs> so, they're there, they are a visual feature, but they are, they, that was another uh, decision, you know, that you learn as you go along. But in February 1, 2003, we had a volunteer day out at that prairie and working with El Paso Gas and Pipeline, I think we had over 300 people that showed up and we went into that remnant and we had a plan of, of digging sod moving it into the areas that we knew we were going to have within the remnant. Try not to disturb, you know, only take so much from the side and bring it over. It was an unbelievable day. A lot of people, the one thing, the largest pot of chili by the Louisiana Cattlemen Association that I've ever seen. Never feed your volunteers chili. <laughs> Production crashed at the end of that pot of chili, mine included. So, um, USGS and Larry, y'all know Larry, he, his group came out and started doing plot work on this restoration. So that was another thing that made this unique. Um, that is a, and I've got this next map, and this is it. So this is the, the 250, 240 acres that's here. This is Highway 14. This is the remnant that's on an old railroad bed, and now there's two gas pipelines that move under it. So it's still there. This is a parish facility that's out of the easement. This area is all the shallow water. We came in here and started the large scale restoration. And this 26, that block, that's Larry's and USGS's plots. They came in looking at seeding rates, how to plant, uh, reducing the nitrogen availability, trying to get it to a situation that mimic. Um, lots of work was going out there. We had transects that were being run trying to determine this water drain back this way here. The one thing that we found out going in there starting in 03 and 04, the driest month, the wettest month of the year in southwest Louisiana is when? And you can't answer. February. July. Historical rain records, July. We get an afternoon shower. It's kind of like being at the beach. Every day it rains. The driest is October. So we were set to plant the fall of 2000. And uh, two, I think it was in three, and we had 25 inches of rain in October. It was like a river runs through. We were out there in Nebu's planting upland prairie. And the one thing we found out was that rice levees, even removed, if there was left with a tenth of, a tenth of an inch difference, it ponded water. So we had our hydrology, the pimple mounds, all of those issues. All of that is to say that we took all of this as this living laboratory for two years. Then we came into this 14 acres and we did this right. So everything that we tried to do down here, we learned from that and we went up. And in 2005, 85 different plant species were planted. 19 grasses, 66 forbs. 
that was all locally collected, Cajun Prairie Society. We bought seed from them in successive years. David Daigle, who's here. I mean, we bought as much local Louisiana seed as we could possibly buy. Every collection that Larry had ever made was stored in the back of this building. He kept a packet, and we took the rest out to his site. <laughs> we did drill. We did hand seeding. We did large-scale broadcast. Um, but so this effort made us realize that just as an agency, we do not have commercially available seed at a scale large enough that if the next landowner came in and said, I want to restore 250 acres, what would we do? Because we were the government and we were bearing the cost and this was a special project and we were able to tag a lot of different fund codes. This cost of this per acre is crazy outrageous, but it was trying to have this laboratory so we could learn so when the next project came in we'd be able to go there. Last thing I just want to point out, these are the transplant sites. Was that planned in October as well? So this was um, done in September and October. It was we prepped all year land prep <coughs> and then in the fall. So other things that were happening at this time beyond our restoration site. The conservation reserve program, which is the Farm Service Agency's retirement program. They had a buffer initiative. That CP33 was a, a quail, Bob White quail initiative to try to put buffers on ag fields to, to develop habitat. That was all having to go back into native plant material statewide. CREP 1, that's a conservation reserve enhancement program. So they got additional cost share, they got additional payments. There's 14,000 of that 50,000 acres that had a 20% minimum native grass component. The CP2 is conservation practice too. That's just native grass planting. There's 500 acres. That all happened in the Mississippi, or uh, the Mississippi River Delta, northeast Louisiana. You go there today and you see loblolly pines where they never should have been planted, right next to a field of Alamo switchgrass which is a eight foot tall panicle that nobody in that area, because they've retired it from ag land, they don't have the equipment, it can't be burned, it's, it's trying to fit to follow national program rules instead of going in and restoring areas with the max diversity, what was commercially available. That was the only thing that was commercially available. We had a prairie crop, so that was so successful up there, we came out of southwest Louisiana, and said, let's go 28,000 acres worth. And of that entire program and these two combined, we probably only did 200 acres. And that's something at the end of the talk, I wanna talk about future steps and how this group can help. It, a couple of things that happened, rice production prices were at an all time low in 05, 06 when we were prepping this. By the time we got the money and got it here, there was that uptick, there was that big boom Clearfield, all those things started happening, and rice producers just were, at that time, were not interested in going into a retirement program. So at that time, this was the way our state was divided, and I'm talking about large-scale programmatically in RCS. If you were doing native plants in this part of the state, you were good to go. We call it, I'm saying good to go. We had 20 different species that had cultivars that were commercially available that would persist. You get into here, that number starts diminishing. You get into the red, the historic coastal prairie, all of our marsh, all of those things. We had one or two species that would, that would work. So this is a flow chart that we used as the government is prone to do. I wish we had sound effects, but is it working? <laughs> Did you mess with it? Yes, shame on you. <laughs> Does anyone else know? No, hide it. <laughs> you're toast. The rest of this flow chart, you're going to see that it all ends back up with your toast. <laughs> so you can look the other way, or you can wade in and say, we're going to try to do something. <laughs> like but I'm going to use yours from earlier when you said... <laughs> You have a failure in one, it just becomes a different type of garden. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> just adjust. It's something. Just, 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 just
That's it. Rename it. Move on. So we waded into the let's develop a local seed production program. So we knew that public funded projects up in Iowa, they had a wildly successful where they made a commitment to revegetate every interstate. The largest landowner in any state is usually the Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. So if you want to affect change on a large scale way, you go from fescue roadsides to native prairie, you can move the needle. Uh, National Park Service, USDA, we have a long standing relationship with our agency and US Forest Service on native uh, forest restoration in the Colorado, that area where we go and collect, increase, and then put back into projects. Private funding, Ground Tree Nursery, they were really getting that program going. They had 115 Truax no-till drills that were being rented out through conservation districts with biologists to give technical support. They were planting, they were converting so much fescue back to native species that farmers, you would rent it, get it on the schedule, and the one farmer was taking it to the other farm, to the other farm, to the other farm, and they were going, and that market was buzzing. Our seed company out of Pennsylvania at this time was having a southeast push. They were coming down from Florida and coming around, but it was going to be a while. The South Texas natives, we, just to throw a little happiness your way and then obscene jealousy is we were killing it. We thought we had it going. Then y'all had a big to do and y'all sent these invitations. Who's y'all? The South Texas natives group out of Kingsville, but it had native grass seed pressed into the paper, the parchment paper of the envelope. And it's like, <laughs> we are, every seed to us is so valuable. <laughs> and you took them and just pressed them into your envelopes to send it out. So they had a combination of state, federal, but then big landowners and donors and, and going through that program. I think you skipped Wait, a bullet. Wait, you're back. You skipped a bullet there. <laughs> well, I thought you were saving the best for life. Yeah, me too. Which Native bullet? Native, Native American C. I'm Native Just about American C. Yeah. I don't know the history of going <laughs> So Native American C, when we, the agency, went to buy seed for our restoration project, the only place that we could find that could sell us thousands of pounds of seed was Bill Nyman, and they were harvesting off of the um, Atwater Prairie Chicken. So Red that's chicken. not, sorry. Go ahead. That's not commercially available? When you can buy thousands of pounds of remnant prairie seed from a prairie remnant, that, and it won't persist, but yet we're going to go look at it tomorrow? Louisiana, define local. And this is, this is from federal government pushing, we needed statewide. Larry was the, there was one angel on this shoulder and Larry, depending on who we were talking, local here is that 50 mile of the remnant. So Texas is not within 50 miles. And so your definition of local, your, lo your definition of native becomes um, arbitrary. <laughs> just depends on who you're in the debate with. So, and, and, and this is no joke, you go over, you buy that seed, you come back and you plant it, and it was a diverse mix, and we had about four species persist. So, was it the conditions? Yes. Was it the fertility? Yes. Was it the seed mix? Yes. Some of the weedy, non-native Louisiana species, you know, the early successional stuff, that's the first thing that pops up. So, I mean, that is, that led us down. We needed to do something with Louisiana, Coastal Prairie, Louisiana Marsh, Louisiana, other savannas to get seeds available. So, Little Blue Stem still rocking over there that you got from Native American seed? Okay, yeah. so, I mean, like, we have thousands and thousands of pounds of that seed available to you right now for like the same price that you would buy seed from Kansas or the Panhandle. If this application works, what are we doing wrong that we can't get it where it needs to go? So I don't think you're doing anything wrong. There's no demand. And then we're gonna to get to that at the end of this. There is no widespread demand in Louisiana for seed to use 20,000 pounds of a little blue stem with clients that we're working with. 
but they would buy a Louisiana cultivar. So they'll buy Native American seed. Y'all, I don't know y'all, I don't know if you're with, but Native American seed is on our seed vendor list. And we have all of our standards, all of our cost lists to allow local varieties to be purchased. I'm just, and I'll get to that in a minute, we don't have that large of demand for large scale restoration. So is that one of the local ecotypes that worked in Texas? Is that why I'm looking at the title? The local program? These were these were efforts. These were <laughs> other programs that we looked at to model after harvest for here for right okay. for Louisiana. So the it, when this started in 2014, this was the dual mission of the Louisiana Data Plan collect, preserve, and increase, and study the native plants of Louisiana, providing an essential step in the development of a native seed plant industry. The thing that this program never was intended to do, this was the, the, the federal, state, local partnership that would do the collection, do the inherent cost, but the whole program was set up to release these plant materials to commercial seed producers. The Louisiana Native Plant Initiative was never in competition with growers. We were not, that was not the model that we were using. We were basing our model off the, the plant materials program within NRCS. So this is a list of partners as it grew, 15 partners strong. Um, the goal was identify the target species, do broad-based collections, do the initial seed increase, learn as much as we can about seed quality, planting rates, those things, try to develop a Louisiana grower infrastructure, and then release to commercial growers. So as this thing grew, we had advisory committees that, that had swell at maybe 60 different members. You would serve on working groups, there'd be a chair of that working group that would then lead to the executive board. Every year we had an annual meeting. These were the working groups. So you had plant materials development, the people that were interested in the plant breeding aspect of it, production and infrastructure, where we were growing these plants. The commercial production side of it, we had companies or we had investors that were interested in becoming uh, production facilities once the releases were going to be made, and then a financing and fundraising. So we tried every outreach strategy that we could to develop interest behind the Louisiana Native Plant Initiative. From organizing seed collection trips, to having fundraisers, to having jambalaya dinners, to going after the streams of financial support uh, congressional earmarks when you were still able to get those. We had universities that were writing those, getting funding to keep things moving. We had volunteer opportunities, uh, seed collection. So this is Louisiana, uh, Little Blue Stem. We sent this out. We had volunteers going out making collections. You'd mark the location, dry the seed, send it in to us. We had, we weren't getting the word out, so we had a quarterly newsletter that was produced. We had annual reports of activities that showed all of our production facilities, and I'm gonna show you here in a minute, and, and what we were trying to do and how we were trying to promote and, and moving forward. This was our release development process. This is the USDA Natural Resources Plant Materials Program release process that we were using back, you know, starting uh, 13 years ago. And so the, our plant material center is located in Galliano, which is about 60 miles south of New Orleans. So you're not gonna grow upland plants there. So we had other production facilities, but it, we went across and then in this source identified, that's the simplest way we can make a release. We find a remnant, we collect the species, we have two handfuls. We turn that two handfuls into five pounds, five pounds into 20 pounds, we plant an acre, try to get that up, collect that seed, and make that release out to the commercial market. The next up from that is a selected release. It's somehow, you know, if there's 
superior genetics, if one's got higher seed producing, disease resistance, then you're going in and you're making small selections out of that. You go all the way across 10 years plus, that's the cultivar release. And that's the model that we used. Again, it was all, we were gonna produce the foundation seed and then turn it over to commercial production. So our plant production facilities, it all started in Lake Charles and McNeese State University uh, at their environmental research center. And it was literally just single rows of plants that we started with. The Coastal Plain Conservancy was a nonprofit that had seven acres that they donated to the project. This is a, our little blue stem uh, crossing block. So those are little blue stems from all over Louisiana that we have there. So that's, that's where it all started. They were able to get that initial uh, federal earmark and that funded that program at that location for about three years for the staff, for the students to maintain and work that facility. Next, we had Nichols State University that came on board, that's in Thibodeau. We had 10 acres out of their school farm. Our plant material center in Golden Meadow provided equipment and labor. Um, that's our plant material center. You can tell the location because that is a, our offices. It's, on 20 foot pilings you know, down in the marsh. But these are the small blocks that we worked. Gary Fine, who was our plant materials program manager when he retired, he took over running that facility. The final and third piece is where y'all are going tonight is the ULL and then the SEAT, Center for Ecology and Environmental Technology. When I was working for the nonprofit, this was our third site that we added and these are those initial blocks. So you can see it really is from two handfuls of seed and we have two or three rows of the plant trying to, to up produce. This was the original goal in 2007, the committee, this was the sweetest species, candidate species that we were targeted to do. And if we were to get all of these out into commercial production and then you take them back and mix them into a coastal prairie mix, this would have been a nice mix of seed that we would have been able to, to produce. So that was the goal, that's where we tried to go. As this program was going, it was the largest unfunded mandate in the history of the federal government. We had no secure funds other than salary. Everything was by donation, by grant, by other funding streams. Um, Commitments from a changing public administration as the agency changed, as state politics changed, could we maintain that leverage? In 13, we were broke. It was, we were out of money. Every employee that was working for the thing was in jeopardy of losing their job. The Finance Committee came up with this 2013 prospectus to come out and say, let's, let's, try to make one last go. We've got all of these seeds that are produced at all of these locations and they're ready to take the next step. Let's make one final effort. So during this time, the first release that we were able to come out with was the Cajun Sunrise Germplasm, Ashy Sunflower, it was released in 2012. And so this was the very first species that we had enough produced that we could then turn that over for commercial seed production. The last one that we have had, and only the second one that we had, is a little blue stem that was turned over from our collections. It was expanded to include all of these from East Texas, and that is the little blue stem release that just came out uh, last month. So those two releases and basically 12 years of effort. So every facility we met uh, last year and it was the, the, the key in all of this was that as a federally run lead partner, we made it very clear to anybody who ever gave money, whether it was a grant or there were other opportunities that came in, was that the entire program was for to release two commercial growers. 
that was the goal. We were never going to compete with, compete with commercial growers. So when this experiment ended, and it had run its course and we'd done everything that we could, we have dissolved the Louisiana Native Plant Initiative. It's no more. So each production facility to maintain their staffing level was given the opportunity to do with what they could to maintain what they had in case it ever came back together again as a partnership. And so where we stood and what we were trying to do and where we were trying to push, and that's where I was getting at earlier with the question, is that there we never reached this critical need that would push commercial seed growers to get involved, or we never had enough customers that didn't have enough seed to move forward. We always knew it was coming, but every time a new project would come in, it would be a quarter acre restoration, be a half acre. It would be a wildlife refuge that might want to plant something. And so the demand for the Louisiana local ecotypes never fully developed. So in Louisiana, this is still, uh, well, that was the slide that I just, just covered. Who owns the seed? What are we going to do? We had, we had seed that was rotting on the shelves at production facilities. So they went out to every available local project that we had, that stuff was planted, They're still maintaining production facilities. Out at seat, Andre came in right before started the talk, and they're still able to keep their plots going. They're selling their seed to a foundation to help pay for a part-time student to maintain it. So each center has, has gone a little bit in a different direction. So, three years ago, this was the way for the agency to look for locally driven, innovative projects to solve local resource concerns. So that's the number one goal of RCPP. All projects are equally evaluated regardless of size. The key here is that we hold back 7% of all of our programs at the national level for this project. So every program that you see listed there, money that comes out from Congress to our agency, we hold 7% back. And that's over $100 million every year that's available for these projects. And it's divided into three funding pools. 25% for state projects, so you only compete within your state border. 40% for national projects. That's if Louisiana and Texas Prairie wanted to get together, that makes it national because it's gone outside, or if you're in an area that's designated by the Secretary of Agriculture, the critical conservation areas. So every, the, the Secretary can name up to eight areas that are designated to compete in. So you have a project that can compete in, in one of three uh, funding pools. It's a competitive process. There's a pre-proposal. <coughs> it's a 10-page pre-fillable form that you're just outlining where your project's going to be, what you're doing, what partnership, and what resources you're bringing. That is then invited back for a full proposal. We just closed those last Friday for this year. So this new cycle will start up again uh, next year. Once a, a proposal is selected for funding, we move into an agreement. So it's an agreement between NRCS and the conservation partner. And so the way those are scored, there's four pillars that we score them on, and it's what is the solution, what's the resource concern, and then what is this project going to do to solve that resource concern. Contribution, the goal from Congress was a one-to-one -one match. So for every dollar the government puts in, the partnership puts in a dollar. That's not a requirement. It's the goal. So your score, 25% of your proposal score, will be based on how well you do against other partners in these pillars. Innovation, how is it innovative? We are taking 93% of our funds and we're putting them out through our delivery mechanism, through our field offices, voluntary conservation. How is this money going to be used differently? What can we do different 
to spend these program dollars. And then participation, two sides of that, partner participation, but then landowner participation, knowing what you're going to do to bring those private landowners in to, to utilize those funds. So this program, the, the call for next year, should be coming out sometime in the winter, November, December, and then it's about a nine month period, pre-proposal to full proposal. So on the Texas side, you have the national pool you can compete in if you link with another state. You can compete within your own state. For Louisiana, this brings in about a million and a half dollars a year.